Well, good afternoon again. Well, it's no secret to anyone that the Middle East has been heating up really, really fast. So what I want to do today is I'm going to pull in something from, actually this was done in 2012, it's a three-part sermon series. I believe it's still in the archives online that you can actually see it from 2012. You see three parts. I'm only using part of this out of part three because what I want to do is tie in what was said back in 2012 to where we are today to actually confirm the scriptures and bring in a lot of the events that's taking today. So today's sermon is army, armies surrounding Jerusalem. So let me begin with two questions. All right, first, who are the armies that are going to surround, surround Jerusalem? First question. And second, you ever thought about this? Are they there to protect or to attack? Which is an interesting question, but the Bible actually tells us what's going on there. So let's begin in Zechariah chapter 14 in verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord comes that your spoil shall be divided in the midst of you. He said, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Well, there you go. Who's going to fight? Pretty much this whole planet. Whether it's actual physical armies there or not, or the support, or through the global beast power that's actually going to be beginning to take place. The Bible is pretty clear. It says all nations. Well, that would have to include the United States. But the United States would never turn their back on Israel, would they? Yeah, they would. And you're seeing it now taking place right before our very eyes with the Palestinians and the way the support is changing. And now the Democratic Party is even turning on itself because they feel like the administration has given too much protection to Israel and those poor people over there, those Palestinians who are just innocent victims of all of this that the United States continues to take advantage of. So anyway, let me go on. So for I'll gather all nations <clears throat> against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the house rifled, and the women ravished. Well, we've heard stories about that, haven't we? It's already beginning to take place right now. Part of the reason they're saying they don't want to let some of the women go who are captives is because of the ravishing that took place now. And so there's the stories that there's no end to. Half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. So one, who fights? All nations. It's pretty simple. The Bible's pretty clear about what's going on there. And two, are they there to defend or attack? And the city shall be taken, it says. Well, it's not complicated when you begin to ask the question. But I've been surprised quite often. I was asked, are they there supposed to be to protect Jerusalem or not? Well, it appears from what we're seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, just like with the United States, God gives people time to repent. When they don't repent, he takes his protection away, and they begin to go down. And you begin to see what's taking place around the world. The same way with Jacob's trouble is because of mankind's sins. All that's all going on right now, right before our very eyes. Then the Lord shall go forth, he said, to fight against all those nations as he fought in the day of battle. The encouraging thing about all of this is that when God says he's going to do something, he fulfills his word. And he says he's going to wipe out the whole planet. He said, but for Jacob, his family, because of his promise to Abraham, he's not going to wipe all of his out. He will be keeping a residue of his people. So in that day, he shall go out to fight against those Norsemen as he fought in the day of battle, in verse 4. And his feet shall stand on that day, or in that day, upon the Mount of Olives. Here lately, I don't know if I should take a little sidestep here, but I certainly I think I will. Because many people in the broken churches now, scattered here and fro, are beginning to change things about what the church has always taught. But what I believe the Bible just said right here. When does all this happen? It says, when all these things take place, it says, and in that day they shall stand on the feet on the Mount of Olives. So when we, it says when we lift up our heads and we see Christ coming in the clouds, it says on that day he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. It doesn't say he's coming down to rapture people away from here. It's on that day, he says, he's going to come stand on the Mount of Olives. Which is before Jerusalem in the east, in the Mount of Olives, and he shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half toward the south. So what we see is some like, massive earthquake taking place, and we're seeing that taking place all the way around the world now. We're talking about that in News Nuggets and Insights. 
that earthquakes now just become so prolific, they're all over the place, all at the same time. And then one's beginning to trigger another one, and the plates the, are shifting. And many of the cities, even in the central part of countries now, are beginning to feel some of these seismic shifts where they've never felt them before. And literally, it's going on all around the world. And God said that was going to happen. We read that in Romans. And well, God says that all earth groans for the time, for the manifestation, for the sons of God. So now, the end time showdown. So let's move on now. In Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. This is something that we've used quite regularly now. And and going all the way back to 2012, we used it even as early as 2012 with Isaiah 46. Remembering the former things, God says, for there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And so as I was going through this, what well, we normally focus on the part that I have underlined. <clears throat> But you know what caught me today? Is I was rummaging through real fast, like, so, okay, so what do I do and what do I tell the people today? It was when I came across these notes in my laptop, and the title said, Army Surrounding Jerusalem, I said, well, that's like today. All that's going on today, and I just got finished spending a couple days putting things together for nuggets for next week with Army Surrounding Jerusalem. So I went in and said, I wonder what I said back then. Because I couldn't remember the scriptures. I couldn't remember how it went down. I just remember talking about it. And so I went in through and I followed the theme that was going through. And you know what the comforting was? Right there. His counsel shall stand. So here's where I'm diverting right now. Is to tell you this. Get to know the word of God. If you're not taking the time to do it. Everybody has busy lives. We have families. We have jobs. We have our own pleasures. We... You know, we, Audrey was just saying right before, we talked about all the food for the, getting for the picnic tomorrow. She says, I'll be glad when the kingdom comes, we don't have to eat no more. <laughs> well, that's her. I didn't say that. Because <laughs> Jesus says he's going to eat when he comes back again. <laughs> so you don't have to eat if you're a spirit being, but he's going to let you eat if you want. <laughs> I digress, I know. But here's what I'm saying. The word of God is true. And what he says he's going to do, he's going to do. And that should remove fear, anxiety, worry. So when you see all these things coming about, when Peter says, lift your head high, not that we glory in what's coming, but we know what's glory for what's coming afterwards. That all of this is going to be over one day. And we can't get to that till we get through this. So let's get through this as quickly as we can. And somewhere I'm, I'm out there, I believe in all my heart that if enough of God's people was dedicated enough and praying enough and loving one enough, maybe God will just cut time really short for his people. Wouldn't that be great? Where all of us, nobody's fighting with one another anymore. We, we finally, we're picking up the pieces and everybody's rendering first aid in, in the kingdom. And the children don't have to worry about what's coming. All that's going to be settled, all going to be over. But we've got to get through this. We've got to get through what's coming. The showdown, Psalm 78, 1 through 4. Give ear, my people, to my law, and incline your ears to my words, O mouth. And I will open my mouth in a parable, God says. And I love that in a parable. When he gives us the parables, he, what he's done, what that means for you and I in the New Testament. You know what that means when you get a parable from the New Testament? You understand it? That God just opened up your mind. In other words, God just took a very special interest in you, personally. Why? Because you can't understand these parables unless he opens up your minds. The, the apostles came to him and said, why do you talk to us so plainly, but you talk to them in parables? He said, because for them it's not to know. So if he's talking to us in parables, you know what that just means? He just means that he brought you in as part of the family, and he's keeping you informed. So he talks to him in parables, it says. And I will utter dark sayings of old, and which we have, have heard and have known, and our fathers have told us, and we will not hide them from our children, showing the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. I've got to come, the words underlined, which comes from the Strong's 34T, which is pronounced Acheron. 
Acheron. I'm probably one of the worst at pronouncing Hebrew, and I'm trying to get a little better at doing that as we go along. But Acheron means the last, or to hinder, to back, the rear. So what he's telling us, he says, he's taken his parable. That means he's opened up the understanding that you didn't understand before. He's preparing it for your, his children, which is you, to come. It means the generation at the end time. I wonder if David knew what he wrote when he wrote that. You know, quite often God gave to, the, to his, uh, his called out ones back then knowledge of understanding and he inspired them with words that they wrote that wasn't even for them. It was for end time, generation, end time generations. And so he's telling us here from, from this parable, from this psalm that David wrote, that at the end time he's going to take something that the world is not going to know He's going to open the understanding. He's going to give it to his children so that they can teach it to their children at the end of days. That's amazing what God does from his scripture, from, from King David back then. Excuse me again. Generation to come, Psalm 78, verse 5 and 6. For he established a testimony in Jacob, and he appointed a law in Israel in which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Why? So that's what God's telling us. Why would he do that? That the generation to come, to come, and there it is, Acheron once more, that they might know the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. Now we just moved into another step of prophecy, believe it or not. Is that, why did he do it? Because the generation to come, the end time, the last time generation, would know the children who would be born in the kingdom of God. That's in the book of Psalms. That's not from the book of the prophets. That's God taking a parable, giving it to a king who's a man after God's own heart, and he sprinkled him with some information and love to share to you and I at the end time. His children. Do you see what I mean about the word of God? Doesn't that inspire to realize what... I couldn't have told you that a year ago. I didn't know it. How much more does God have for us in this holy word that we've read a thousand times that he hasn't showed us yet? That's why it's important to understand the word of God. Don't worry about what's happening out there. Pray for what's happening out there, but draw your comfort in God and in his word. Now, let's go on. Here's Psalm 102, 16 through 18. For the Lord shall build up Zion, and he shall appear in his glory. Build up Zion. Okay, here we go now. We're moving into an end time. We're going to get into where there's a prophetic time that's coming. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute, and shall not despise their prayer. Again, he's talking about his people. When does he build up Zion? Well, at Acheron, at the end time, when he begins to build up Zion. He said, this shall be rendered for the generation to Acheron, the generation to come. Again, we're still in Psalms. We're not in the prophets. We're in the Psalms where God related to someone who loved him. Now, why did I just tell you that? Because you want God to know that you love him. And because you will do that, if it's sincere, if it's true, and you're not trying to put on an air before God, he's going to take and he's going to do you what he did David, because he's not a respecter of persons. He's going to give you all the peace and all the comfort that you need. And he's going to take you to places you never dreamed you will ever go. He'll give you knowledge and understanding you never dreamed you could ever have. And that will only be the beginning. We were talking last week after service. and said, you know, I can't wait till we get into the, the millennium. How'd you like to go to a Bible study with Jesus Christ? Wow, what would that be like, huh? When he starts talking about the historical facts of his day. Well, his day began like, well, that's right, he never had a beginning. <laughs> so he could tell us stuff we never ever dreamed before the earth was. Won't that be incredible? It's amazing what's out there waiting for you and I that you and I can never dream of. But see, that's all out there. It's all beyond here. 
Because see, we've got to get past here. For the generation to come, a people yet to be created that may praise the Lord. A people yet to be created. All right, now, the rising up of Zion, right? The regional conflict. Back in 2020, we called this, the news called it, the regional conflict. And there it is, if we got that screen up there again. So I, I took it as the regional uh, conflict back then. We brought in the Middle East and what was going on back there. So now I want to show you what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you from the transition of what was going on then in 2012 and 2013 to where it is today. So as we go through the, by the way, you know, you know what you're going to see is, is a better grade of PowerPoint slides. I don't know if you noticed that when I go back and looking back then, I thought we were doing high tech technology. I look at it today and it's like, man, that's pretty shallow stuff. <laughs> but the technology's changed. So you get, you get, you get to use better stuff to be able to bring out your messages. All right, so now let's get back to the Middle East. All right, so here's where we are. We're looking at the Middle East. I just kind of blew it up. There's Iran. Now, we need to keep our eyes on Iran right now because I don't know if you've heard most of the, your military leaders in America and many of the senators and many of the congressmen, they're trying to encourage the president to go fight with Iran right now. They're telling them, we need to go in and send military in and just take out Iran. Well, we've tried to do that kind of stuff before. Every time we do it, never ends well for the United States. And it won't win well this time either. Not when you understand the prophecy. But you're going to see it next year in coming in. And it's going to be part of my message in uh, the rise and fall of America uh, coming in for next, for, uh, begin at the end of this month. Because it involves Iran. A lot of this does involve Iran. But for us to go in there now, we're not prepared for this. It's an absolute nightmare. It would be a quagmire we can never get out of. The regional conflict in 2012. All right, so there's our Middle East. That is the shadow that precedes the event. The shadow precedes the event. So like if you've got a light and you're putting it on the event, the shadow behind it is what comes first. So in prophecy, that's what we're looking at. So you're looking at the future, which is posing through an event, that's causing a shadow for what's eventually going to come. 2012 was one of those shadow events that took place back then. Look what was going on back then. When the, uh, the rising, it was, it was like the, uh, the Middle East, what would they call that, the, uh, some, the spring? The, the Arab Spring, I believe they called it back then. We spent a lot of time tracking down the Arab, what was going on there, the Muslim Brotherhood, all these different changes in power, the murdering, all this stuff was taking place. The United States back then sent in the U.S. aircraft carrier, Abraham Lincoln. By the way, is there any aircraft carriers over that way now? Yeah, I think there's three of them, right? There's three of them over there right now taking place. So then, then after that, they sent approximately 50,000 troops massing all around in the Middle East where we had bases. Anything happened to the Americans around in the bases all around? Oh, yeah. We had like over 75 attacks right now on Americans in the Amer American bases and the ships right now. And like there's no war going on. They're just constantly trying to provoke the United States into a physical battle and a war in the Middle East so they could pull in China and they could pull in Russia and maybe even Turkey when you get all these things going on. So I'm going to show you all that today. But now they had 50,000 troops that were massed back there. This, these slides are actually online. This is where I got... Everything I got here, except for the 2012 here, the shadow, all that we said in 2012. This all took place in 2012, what you're looking at. Israel was the potential strike to Iran. They were beginning to say they were going to go strike, strike against Iran if anybody went against them, like they said, like just now. And that's what they said. We're not going to stop this war with Gaza. They're going to wipe them off the planet. They're tired of this, they said. The recent agreements, this was written in 2012, recent agreements with Turkey allowed the United States to use sea bases and land bases for up to 62,000 troops that were stationed in Egypt, I mean in, in uh, Turkey. So you see the shadow of what was coming back then. Then the United States at that particular time still had 91,000 troops in Afghanistan. So we've got over a quarter of a million men over there. We've got ships, we've got planes, you, got, you name it, it was over there. People were ready for things to begin to happen. 
I personally, I'm glad I don't prophesy because I'm thinking <laughs> we're in the seven years of lean back then. We had seven years after 2001. It seemed things, everything was just money, 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 money. By 2008, boom, everything collapsed. And it was going down. And it felt the scenario that I'd been looking for for a long time. Seven years of plenty, seven years of, of lean. And it seemed like this was what was going to happen. And when you look at the prophecies, 1948, 1949, the children, uh, that generation shall not pass. Man, everything to me was pointing to 2020. So during that time, you have to have the lean years. Then come the, uh, the uh, uh, seals of God. I said, wow, we're in that period of time, what I was looking at. But it wasn't. You see, that was the shadow. That's why you have to keep your mind open. You know, at some point in time, we may come to where we're today, say, hey, we're in another shadow. You know, this is going to happen here, where we think we are today. I don't think so this time. I think there's too much information God's revealed to his church now that really confirms and begins to lock down the prophecies like we never understood back in 2012. Going on. So now, here we are again in the Middle East. And that little, put a, you can see it on the screen, there's Israel, the little, little country of Israel in the Middle East, and all these people, all the nations of the world, <laughs> are going to fight that little country. <clears throat> now, I just blew up that little country, so we get a, a good size look at, the, at the, uh, the nation. There it is, Israel. So now if we go again, there's Jerusalem in the middle of it. Let's blow that up one more time. And now we're in Jerusalem. Now the whole world is going to gather to get to fight that little bitty country in that little bitty city. Can you believe that? You talk about a bunch of bullies. They hate Jesus Christ because they know that's where he's coming. So Satan roused the whole world up to stop Jesus Christ from doing what? Putting his feet on the Mount of Olives. And God's going to let them do everything they can to the, that Satan looks like he's going to win. And at the last moment, he's going to step in and he's going to wipe them away with his breath and it'll be done. It will be done once and for all. But we've got to get there, right? So now we've got to get there. So here we go. Ezekiel 8 verse 3 says, So he put forth in the form of a hand, and he took me by the lock of my head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me into the visions of God to Jerusalem. You know, I love that scripture, Ezekiel 8 verse 3. I use it quite regular uh, in sermons because what, what I like about it is because God shows us here how he can take and lift us up and let us see what he sees from his perspective. Isn't that incredible to be able to, to do that, to see what God sees? Not to see what he sees alone, but to see it from his mindset. That's something that's hard to do because our minds are never like his. You know, we, we just, even our best days are nothing but, like he says, just foolishness to him. <clears throat> to the door of the inner gate, which looks to the south, and there was the seed of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. So there we have the reason why. Because you see, Satan wants that throne. He wants this planet. He wants to destroy God's people. That seat, that throne, where Jesus Christ is going to sit, when that day comes, when he's on that throne, when his feet stands on the Mount of Olives, Satan can't stand that. It's the seat that provokes the jealousy, it says. And so he's going to rouse up this whole world to stop it. And he'll fail again. Thankfully, he will fail again. But God says that in Psalms 147, verse 2. He's going to build up Zion. The Lord does build up Jerusalem. He gathers them together as the outcast of Israel. So he's going to build up Jerusalem. He's been building it up. It actually started in 1917. And we've seen it again in 1947. So watch what happens here. 1947, there's Palestine. That's the year before they actually have the state of Israel. Now, Let's leave that up there, Jeff, as I go through this. See that red box I put there? You know what's hidden in that red box that I didn't bring out in 2012? There's a little strip of land called Gaza. You know it now, don't we? We didn't see it back then. It was there the whole time. But watch what happens as things change through the years. So then from 47, we see the plan goes in, the UN plan in 1947, and Israel begins to take over more of the land as the green begins to dis disperse. This whole land actually was given to Israel. 
It never was designed to be given to the Palestinians. So now you see as the green disappears, those are the Palestinians' lands, they're leaving it. That was the plan, the UN plan. But see that red box? That red box doesn't change. Look what happens by 1949 and 1967. That red box is still shadowing that city, that state, that country, whatever they want to call themselves. Never paid much attention to it till now, other than having to fight these Palestinians over there, Gaza, as it is. And then we get to 2005, and look what happens. The Greens disappeared as we went. Every time the nations went against Israel, they lost ground. Every time, since 1947. They come fight Israel. Israel takes over. He wins, defeats them, takes over their land. Now they come back and say, that ain't fair. Give us back our land. You're vicious, rotten people. You destroyed us. No, you did that. You did that. But there it is again. Isn't that amazing? It's been sitting there. God laid the prophecies out from years ago, and that's what I'll be bringing out in that next sermon, The Rise and Fall of America, because it connects a lot of this into that time. Now, let's pull in today. Let's pull in today. World Watch today. This is what I'm bringing out this coming week. Next Friday, you're going to have this in News and Nuggets with other things. This little segment that I'm bringing in right now. All right, we're good on time. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah would bring that, that a couple times. So that's where we are today. There is no more peace in our land. We're now in the modern day axis of evil. And we've been, we've been bringing this out now for the last two years, especially one, Russia, two, China, three, Iran. These are the evil influences that are driving other nations. When you go into look at these Palestinians, these Arab nations, those who are warring with Israel, look at their weaponry, look at their technology, and look at where their funding is coming from. You will track it from Iran through to these nations that brings them from Iran to other nations, which the, the, the United States calls their proxies. In other words, they get somebody else to do their fighting for them. All right, those are the evil influences driving the nations. By the way, there were three in World War II. These were the axes of evil. There are many wars in many nations, but there were three major axes of evil. Germany, China, um, Germany, uh, Japan, and who's the other one? Italy. Not Mussolini. Italy. Not Mussolini. <laughs> Not Mussolini wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, Mussolini. It was Italy. It was Italy. He literally, he went and he actually started the whole thing. And Hitler was inspired by him and followed through because uh, Mussolini, what an evil person. Those are the evil influences, and that's what's going on right now. And now they take a more sophisticated approach. China, Russia, and Iran are moving in their proxies into the United States. You ever wonder why there's so many coming in without wives and children? Where are these, all these going? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young men, fighting age men. How do they live and how do they exist? They're not taking jobs. What are they doing? How are they supplying the information going back to who sent them here and where did they get the money? And literally now, after so many years, there's millions of people across the United States where God says they're going to rise up from inside you. They're going to eat you like a canker sore, and you're going to grow, but somebody else is going to take it, somebody else is going to eat it, and you're going to be infested like a bug on the inside, and it's going to destroy you from within. And you let it happen right before your very eyes, and the United States will not stop it. They will not stop it. And the Republicans said they can get in. Well, they had their chance to get in and do it. They never did anything either. They just, well, because God gave them reprobate minds. And because, because they're evil in leadership at large. I'm not saying everybody is, but it's hard to find someone who's not. And if they are, no one trusts them. And no one will deal with them. And no one will work with them. Why? Because they're honest. They can't be trusted. They're not part of the old boy's system. So there's no hope for this country. I hope you see that. And then the debt just continues to pile up and pile up. Do you realize the debt, interest rate, 
And the money that's given to maintain the illegals in the United States now is about 25% of all the money that comes into America's income. 25%. Then when you take out Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and all the money that's got to go back out to there, you've got less than 30% to run our country. We cannot pay the debt. They're expecting the interest on the debt next year because the interest rates now, as the, as the cheap interest rates come due, they have to renew them. They have to renew them at higher rates. So you're going to see the interest balance debt go up faster. You're going to see that spike just continue to go up. And they can't catch it. There's no way to stop it. The rest of the world knows it. And they're waiting for the time. And when God pulls that plug, boom, it's over. And it will come tumbling very fast. Now, that's what I've been talking about. When that happens, and we look at the Joseph's timeline, where do you want to be when that happens? Of course, there's always two ways. The first thing is spiritually close to God, as I led this sermon. That's where you want to be. But does that mean that you need to stay where you live today also? Now, I know people who live in great places, and I say, man, you don't need to move. I think God, I mean, you're in a safe spot for the most part. You got friends, you got family. You know, you don't need to move anywhere. But there are people, I'm telling them, like, you need to get out the way. I mean, I don't know how you're going to do it. And, and like people say, well, I got somebody kind of chewed me out. He said, well, you kind of wait a little late to tell people to, to do that now. A lot of us are old. <laughs> I'm 71. I'm not a spring chicken. But when you find out, I don't care how old you are, don't you want to do something if you're in a bad spot? I told a person the other day, I said, well, listen, when I grew up and I was in a bad neighborhood, I grew up down by Clayton. I grew up in the Ninth Ward. The Ninth Ward's not good. He's in the lower Ninth Ward. It went, from, it went from decent to bad to where Clayton's at, worse. The lower Ninth Ward was one of the worst. Almost all my friends I grew up in with in the neighborhood were either, are either dead or in prison. That's how bad our neighborhood was. That neighborhood ate my younger brother. He got into the drugs, he got into crime, and he died. I got phone calls from people, come get him out of jail every single week. There'd be drugs and somebody said, oh yeah, you heard what happened so so, yeah, he's dead, they shot him the other night. That's the neighborhood I grew up in. My dad knew it was eating up his sons and his family. So what did he do? He moved us out. He brought us to another area. By that time, I was in high school. You know, fortunately, I never went into all of that. I never took drugs. I never smoked. To this day, I've never smoked. It never made any sense to me. I was thankful God just gave me enough wisdom to realize, like, why are my friends just destroying their lives? I was called fat boy. Still am. <laughs> I just never had, my weight was just never down. I just, that's something I just, I tried and never stayed. But they, all the people would call me. They said, go get fat boy to come get you out of jail. Go get this and go get him out of the hospital or to bring him home or to go pick up stuff that they had stolen so they can bring over to have it merchandise for them so they can go pay their bail and get them out. That was my neighborhood. So what I'm saying is like at some point in time, you realize God can protect you anywhere you, you are and he will. But if he showed you that this is not a good spot to be in, don't you think you ought to move? Don't you think you ought to do something? That's all I'm saying here. Moving to the Mississippi area, I'm hoping that we build, I call it a refuge, maybe it's not a refuge. I'm hoping that at some point in time, there'll be enough people who can move in, sell their homes, buy them a piece of land, take a piece of plot of the land, and build a community of God's people hunkered down together before God who can care for one another during those bad times that's coming. I don't know what's so hard to understand about that. Maybe I'm not doing a very good job of sharing how the dream and the vision is. But we start tomorrow. And tomorrow, there's going to be out there a guy that's out there. He texted me this morning. He said, the equipment is out there. We will be cutting the hay tomorrow morning. I said, wow, that's going to be really nice. The brethren will be out there. And they'll see the hay. And God provided a piece of land that's self-supporting. They can cut the hay three times out there and pay the expenses on the property. And there's no taxes. So all we have to do is focus on how do we continue to do the work now? 
I mean, where can you go to that you don't add expense and debt to you? You go out there, you have no debt, you have no taxes, you have the land that's self-supporting so far to pay utilities, and you go to work. That's what this is going to be. And I believe God's got a really a path for all of us to be on that's going to help. And it doesn't have to be done today or tomorrow. And I'm not saying everybody needs to be out there. But when you come there, you need to be ready to work. It ain't going to be a commune when you're just going to sit on your butt. But you can help with one another. You know, it's, it's that people can come together. I tell you, I, I was dreaming the other day when I was sitting out there. I said, you know, we get this other building built. Wouldn't it be so nice to have 100 families and they, they're within 10, 15 miles of the property? And they come together in the morning and we fellowship, having coffee, talking about what we're going to accomplish for the day, talking about how we can produce food and put it up for the brethren down the road, how we're going to produce seeds and send it to brethren around the country that they can grow their own products and their own food when you can't buy seeds anywhere. I was just sitting there dreaming. And everybody sitting together in fellowship and prayer. And just, God bless the day that it prospers all of us. And we go to work. And then some of us will go to the studio and we begin producing more programs. So we have another person shows up, like showed up in the middle of nowhere in a small town, saying, Ben, I was watching a program, great job. I mean, in my wildest dreams, I never thought something. And the hope that God had me said, maybe you got us on the right path, Father. I hope you don't mind me digressing from where I'm at today, but I didn't have a lot to start with, and I only had three hours to put this together. So what I thought I would do is show you part of the past, part of the future, and tell you where the desire and the love that God's given to our church and to our brethren. But wouldn't it be nice together to come together in the morning, you know, it's sit down, have a cup of coffee, get your game plan, and everybody go to work. You don't have to fight traffic. You don't have to find man bosses. You don't have to worry about who's going to give you off on the Sabbath because if you're working out there, you're going to be removed. No working on the Sabbath. You get the holy days the, the off. Nobody's going to fight you for it. It's amazing what God's got. And there's so many more things I can share with you what's in the works right now. We haven't even got there yet. And it's for his people. I think God's given us a vision for his people that's going to be open for all his people. It doesn't have to be this organization. It has to be God's people. People who want to follow him, who want to love him, who wants to keep his laws. He wants to care for one another. When they're sick, to be able to, to come to each other and comfort one another. When Elwood got sick, I could pick a phone up like I did with Danny. I said, Danny, I was sick over there. Can you run, pick him up some soup, some medicine and stuff, and make sure he's taken care of? He says, okay, I'm right on it. Isn't that the kind of world you want to live in? And he did, and he, and he gave me the list. He got everything, things I never even thought about. Gave him crackers and some other stuff that he says, oh, yeah, when he's sick, he might want this. And brought it up and had it heated and brought it to him. He said, here you go. You know, take it easy today. Is, am I coming across what I'm trying to say, what we want to do? I'm the hardest guy. I'm, listen, I'm not easy to work with. I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot of patience with people who are not. I really don't. Clayton's laughing. He hears me fuss when I chew, chew people out. I'm hard to work with. Because I require a lot of people, out of people. But I feel like I'm a, I'm a decent, generous person to, to be able to care and love for one another. But you're going to have to hold your, your end up, and you have to do your job. That's what God requires of all of us. And if everybody does their job, man, I tell you, well, you accomplish so much in the, in the work at large, the people, your families will be blessed. Somewhere down the road, let's say, so let's say you moved into... You sold your house, you bought five acres. You don't need a big place. You know, just put a small place up there. The smaller the better. Your families who don't listen to you now, in three years they're going to say, where's mom and dad? I need to go talk to them. This is really bad. And then the family come looking for you to say, hey, listen, we got real problems. And, and you can say, okay, listen, let me help you. And give them peace and give them comfort. And the truth they won't listen to, they may listen to then. I don't know what's coming, but I know there's an innumerable multitude that we have to help. And that's coming. And we want to do our part to be able to do that. Well, anyway, we get back to the sermon. As the influences grow, so do the growth of the nations. Yemen. What about Yemen? What has Yemen got to do with any of this? Out of the blue, the Houthis out of Yemen decide to start shooting rockets at Israel. 
not just at Israel, at American ships. Where did they get these rockets and technology? China, Russia, Turkey. You see, many of the weapons are Turkish. All going through Iran into them. Now, how about this one? Have you heard this one? Algeria. Did you know that Algeria, 100% of their parliament just voted to go to war with Israel? <coughs> Algeria. You would think a little country like Algeria. I'm going to show you a video in, in a few minutes about Algeria. All right, here we go. The Middle East. There's Israel. All right, so Israel in the Middle East. Let's get it to its perspective. See how little it is when it's in there? Luke 21, we've been talking about armies of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You know desolation is near. All right, so we know all of that's going to begin to take place. So let's move that out the way. Let's play a psalm of a video about prophecy. We got that video ready, Jeff? Short, about two minutes long. We played it back in 2012. I want to play it again. Let's play the video. That was such an interesting video the first time I ever saw it. To this day, it still it's like, t just touches me because it goes through all those countries, tell you who they are today as they go through their countries. All that's taking place in the Middle East. 
Here's Israel, now that's Gaza. To see where Gaza's at, we got that up on the screen. I'm going to zoom that out a little bit. There's that little piece of land that was hidden, stuck down there, and nobody paid much attention to through the whole battle because it wasn't time yet, but now the time is there. It was all taking place. So now as we move on, we talked about the beginning of Hamas, the day that calls for a global jihad. It's interesting that it actually began with the second seal, the opening of a second seal. It also begins with the second year of lean. And you have to wonder in the seven-year period, is God opening a seal each year? Well, I don't know. We'll have to wait and to see what's going on. <clears throat> Hamas is in the Bible, and it is a terrorist group which lives up to his name. The Hebrew word Hamas is a noun meaning an act of aggression and especially involving physical contact. The biblical word for Hamas or violence is what the Bible uses. And if you look up violence, you will find the Hebrew word Hamas written. It is an acronym for the, for the word which reaches back all the way to the earliest chapters of Genesis, and it said the world was filled with Hamas, with violence is what it was. And that's in Genesis 6, and I believe Genesis 6.13 also uses the same word the second time back then. Zephaniah, what was waiting for was God to open up that book, the opening the book of Zephaniah, which we believe is one of the confirmations of the opening of the second seal. Because it says when Zephaniah, when all these things are taking place, when God says that she shall be forgotten in Ashkelon, the desolation, and says, Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, because they are part of the Philistine, the generations. And all of these things are coming together, which I will bring out in the fall of America, and how this ties in with the Philistines and, and with Iran today, and how all these things are merging right now, right before our very eyes. But the world has no clue. The word the Chariots, as you see in verse 5, woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Chariots. The Chariots means the executioners. It's buried, hidden, in, deep within the bounds of Israel over there at the time were these executioners who are going to bring violence and destroy. And they're raising up right now. And you have seen now in two months how they have literally attacked, destroyed, killed, raped, sodomized, and destroyed, burnt, cut off heads. And the world hates Israel after they got attacked for it. Unbelievable, but that's what's going on right now. Then Lebanon decides they're going to come into the battle and begin shooting rockets down from the north of Israel. And also out of Syria, Hezbollah, these two nations have pulled together to attack Israel. So now you have Israel being attacked from the south and two nations out of the north that's being taken place right now. There's Hezbollah, there's the leaders as they sit in their, their rich lands over in these five-store hotels talking about how they're going to end the war and get the whole world riled up against Israel. I don't understand if this is a war. Why don't you just go get this guy and arrest him? Put him in prison. But they won't. They sit there and negotiate while he's being fed at a five-star hotel while lives are being lost every single day. What kind of world do we live in today? Well, Jesus Christ is going to put that back into motion. So now we have those two nations all coming back down together. And then Yemen comes in. Remember, we talked about what is Yemen to do it. Here's the Houthis that are there. They began shooting rockets. And by the way, they just shot three different targets all at the same time with numerous rockets going off, which is something they've not had capability of before now to be able to do that. The Houthis in Yemen, they joined the battle against Israel. They joined the battle on October 19th. They had fired four land attack rocket cruise missiles and 14 drones that an American Navy that the American Navy intercepted. Also, one went after the, the Navy ship itself. Fortunately, they've, got, they've had good defense uh, weaponry. Otherwise, you see many more people dead with the Americans at this particular time. But look at that nation. Look at the war power that you're looking at. That's a picture out of Yemen. Unbelievable, but that's what's going on. How much? Look at the firepower that's coming against Israel right now. Now we're talking about Algeria. And in Algeria, this like, what is it Algeria doing here? And I'm thinking like, Algeria? What is Algeria? And you're thinking, a little Polduck nation over there? Well, they're not. When you begin to understand the history of the time over there, and then you understand who they are and their weaponry, you're going to be absolutely shocked what I'm going to show you. The Algerian parliament unanimously votes to support the Palestinian military. 
This is a longer video. I'm going to play the whole video. It's about seven to eight minutes long. I want you to see this nation, the weaponry they have, who just voted 100%, giving their president total power, like a miniature Hitler, to decide when he wants to attack Israel. He needs no more permission. Let's play that second video, Joe. The Algerian parliament has issued an approval allowing the nation to engage in warfare against Israel in defense of Palestinian civilians. This declaration of readiness for war is a result of a unanimous agreement among its citizens. A vote was conducted and 100% agreed to engage in conflict with Israel. With this decision, Algeria becomes the second country, following Yemen, to openly announce its intent to combat Israel. This move is particularly significant given Algeria's long history in the battlefield. Its military forces are formidable, influenced by its proximity to Russian and Chinese proxies and its past as part of a once mighty empire. Let's explore together the history and military strength of this nation. Algeria was once a part of the Ottoman Empire. It's widely known that the Ottomans were a formidable force stretching across two continents. Ottoman Algeria was one of the empire's territories, renowned for its lethal military strength. Algeria is a country on the Mediterranean coast of North Africa. The Ottomans expanded their reach into Africa through Algeria, among other regions. The military strength of Algeria in the past included various elements that made them a formidable force on the battlefield. One key component of the Algerian forces was their strong cavalry composed of horses and chariots that provided advantages in speed, momentum, and elevation during assaults. This gave them an edge in transporting equipment, logistics, and spoils from successful raids. A skilled archer in the Algerian forces could bury arrows under a sand dune, bait the enemy into a chase, and then strike while retreating. The Algerian light cavalry was adept at pursuing retreating enemies, shielded by defense. The use of horses, camels, and other pack animals played a crucial role in logistics across the hot desert terrain of Algeria, where sourcing water was vitally important. Over time, tribal warfare continued in the Algerian desert, and several tribes adopted Islam as they met for trade. Larger expeditions resulted in new trade relationships and documented observations that were crucial in mapping the region and spreading livestock and horses across the territory. Subsequently, successor states employed weapons such as rifles, swords, helmets, and metal shields in their warfare. The French army conquered Algeria in 1830, facing prolonged opposition from Algerian rebels led by the resistance leader Abd el Kader. The French conquest of Algeria necessitated scorched earth tactics and resulted in substantial losses among the native population. The French army recruited troops from Algeria, predominantly from the Berber and Arab tribes. Algerian forces participated in various French colonial campaigns and wars, also aiding in World War I. Following World War I, France began mandating military service for Algerian citizens to bolster recruitment. World War II saw an increased number of Algerians fighting in the French army, and the warfare continued thereafter. In modern times, Algeria has continued to develop its military strength and plays a strategic role in the region. Advancements in military technology, progression in tactics and strategy, and a focus on modernization have enabled Algeria to maintain significant military power in the present day. The nation continues to adapt to new threats, strengthening its national security and its role in maintaining regional stability. As a result of its historical trajectory, Algeria's military has evolved into the second largest army with the largest defense budget in Africa. The country has even had a peaceful nuclear program since the 1990s. According to Global Firepower's ranking of countries by military strength, Algeria boasts 130,000 active soldiers, 135,000 reservists, and 200,000 paramilitary personnel, totaling 465,000 troops. 
Citing the Middle East Institute, the new military spending budget of the country is around 18 billion US dollars. While this is equivalent to about 10% of Algeria's GDP in 2022, it has decreased from a previous budget of 23 billion US dollars. Despite the reduction, this figure still remains the largest defense budget on the African continent. Global Firepower ranks Algeria 26th out of 145 countries in terms of the largest and most powerful militaries, and second in Africa after Egypt. Furthermore, before delving into its arsenal, it's important to note that Algeria is part of the African Union Political Alliance, a member of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, and ranks among the top 10 natural gas producing countries. All these factors are essential in assessing the country's military strength. Reflecting on Algeria's military history, which initially relied on horses and cavalry for its strength on land, it is fitting that the Algerian army today ranks 17th globally. The Algerian army, established in 1962, currently has 110,000 active personnel. Its arsenal includes 1,105 ready tanks, 314 towed artillery pieces, 146 self-propelled artillery units, 194 rocket artillery systems, and 23,394 vehicles. Algeria operates some of the world's most formidable tanks, including Russian-made T-90SAs and French Panhard AML-60 reconnaissance tanks. Their standard rifle is a Chinese variant of the AK-47 AKM. Recently, Algeria has acquired cutting-edge armaments like the 9K-720 Iskander, a Russian-made short-range ballistic missile system capable of hypersonic speeds reaching Mach 6-7 approximately 4,567, 5,328 miles per hour. It can ascend to 31 miles and has a range of up to 310.7 miles. Algeria's Navy is ranked 15th worldwide according to Global Firepower. This is significant considering Algeria's role as a key player in the Western Mediterranean. The Algerian Navy was developed and organized with assistance from the Soviet Union during the Cold War and currently has 30,000 active personnel. Key naval bases are located in Algiers, Anaba, Mers El Kabir, Oran, Jigel, and Tamantfaust. While Algeria does not possess any aircraft carriers, its fleet includes 201 warships, 5 frigates, 6 corvettes, 25 patrol boats, and 6 submarines. Their amphibious assault ship, the LPD Kalat Bini Abes, is a standout in their oceanic fleet. The Miko A-200 serves as their premier frigate, and they also operate the stealthy C-28A corvette. Off. Did you guys kind of get like tilt after a while? It's like, that's just too much facts to understand. Israel had to wake up one morning and know that they were going to war with this country. That's just one country. You got Yemen, you got all these other countries, you got Russia coming down. That's what they're up against right now, over there. Then I got Iran coming down the road, who's eventually going to begin to maneuver and the United States is going to actually go into war with. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to save the rest of this for news nuggets and insights, but we've been covering a lot of this. How the left now has been turning on Israel. The world's turned its back on Israel. The world now, <clears throat> these are all headlines, on the abyss that the world changed its trajectory according to the Middle East and the warns of its Security Council. All of these things are beginning to take place and they're escalating each and every day. There have been 61 attacks on U.S. military bases. Oh, wait, that was last week. Now it's up to 77. In other words, you're listening and you're watching right before your very eyes what God says is going to preclude the next war. Why did I take the time to play that long video that you get so tired of listening to about what's that got to do with God's word? That has everything to do with God's word. It's one of the nations that's just declared war in Israel. That at some point Israel may have to wake up to have to deal with. When all these people come together, their only hope is going to be God Almighty and Jesus Christ coming back down to this planet. Hamas, we've covered before. I'm just going to zigzag through this real fast. 
during, during this time, America, where would be America at this time? We wrote back in 2012 that America will not be in power anymore by the time this happens. We would basically be taken out of the position and be in a non-influence as we go through. In Leviticus 26, in 16 to 17, God says, this is what I'm going to do to you because you didn't obey my word. He said he's going to set his face against us, just like he's doing over there in the Middle East. With the United States out of the way, the Muslim coalition and army, which will be assisted by Russia's might, well, it might attack the whole land. You see that in Ezekiel 30, 38. And there's been many countries, many nations, waiting for this thing to take place. Ezekiel 38. Israel's neighbors with Syria, which Hamas, Gaza, Hezbollah, Lebanon, they're all preparing now to be able to go into a war that they're trying to preempt the United States into to make this a global world war. Just like with the, in, the, in the past... Ancient Rome will emerge as a political force. What well, I mean by ancient Rome is Babylon. It's the Holy Roman revival. The world will embrace a single religion. The world will accept a single government. And Babylon will emerge as a prominent city in a world of world affairs. We are at the beginning of all those things taken right now. And it talks about the time of the surrounding. Why? Because Satan knows he has but a short time. So all these things are continuing. Thus we will continue to see the tensions and the aggression rise against Israel. And Israel will continue to build up as God says he was going to do. And it will protect itself, thus bringing in the anger of the world. Because every time Israel is attacked and they defeat their enemy, the world gets angrier at Israel. Eventually the nations around them will encircle them and will attack Israel. What I wanted to do today is we show you in 2012 of what we understood and showing you today what God is giving us today is the day by day escalation as we watch it according to the word that we didn't understand from back then. So where are we now? We are at the beginning of armies surrounding Jerusalem. I do not believe it'll stop this time. It may slow down and the tension may begin to halt it for a bit, but it'll only be a pause between the next escalation. I believe we're at that beginning stages right now. So I took the time to show you Algeria. I don't know if you knew it, but I was shocked when I saw that video. I said, if I'm this shocked, maybe the brethren are this shocked too. Because we don't understand all the history. But the first thing I heard, the Ottoman Turks. Because the Ottoman Turks, Turks controlled Jerusalem for 400 years. So we're at the beginning of that stage right now. So anyway, there you have it. Army surrounding Jerusalem 2023. Keep your eyes up. Keep your nose up. Keep clean. And hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow at the picnic. The beginning of that stage right now. So anyway, there you have it. Army surrounding Jerusalem 2023. Keep your eyes up. Keep your nose up, keep clean, and hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow at the picnic.